Hello and welcome to the Shepherd's Rest Doc Talk. This is episode 22A. I'm Cam and this is Julie. This week's Torah portion is from Genesis 37 to the end of chapter 40. This week's Torah portion has so many different levels. The reason why there's so much in this um, Torah portion is because of what is called in Jewish literature um, the Paradez. I'm not sure if I say it correctly, but it's it's four levels in which scriptures understood and the first level is uh, Parsat which means the simple it's what's really actually happening there was a person named Jacob there was a person named Joseph Joseph right. really did go look for his brothers he really did get thrown in a well all those things really happen the next is the Remez which means a hint that's more of the um, implied you know by the way something said you imply that they were angry or you right those right. understandings then the next one is the drash. The drash is the search. You're looking for things. It's where we find the allegorical or the typologies, which there's a ton of typologies. In and the last one is the sod. The sod is the mystical. It's the hidden. It's um. It's my favorite. It's mm -hmm. I think the things that requires the Holy Spirit to give right. us insight. I bring those four points up so we realize that as we discuss things, you can have, you could listen to someone um, teach on the so, the mystical, and then someone speak about the the passat, the, what was happening. And it doesn't rule out either one. They work right. together. That's the great thing. You may be reading scripture and the Lord show you something and you mm -hmm. think, oh, well, I haven't heard that. So the Holy Spirit can definitely be showing you something new. That happened to me this week. Things I've never heard, but as I read, I'm like, oh, I see I, this. I, I, I see, see this. this. And that's the Holy Spirit. That's you know, it says that he is our teacher. That's right. so, so let's start with chapter 37. So at this time, remember, Isaac hasn't died yet. Um, Joseph is 17. They've moved from Shechem, but they still have land in Shechem because Joseph goes there to see his brothers who are supposed to be tending the sheep and the goats in Shechem. And everyone fears them. The Lord, remember when they went up to, right when they went up to Bethel for, with the Lord. The Lord said He put fear in the people mm -hmm. so that they would not um, have any revenge on Joseph. So there, or excuse me, on Jacob's family. I feel that we need to shed some light on an aspect that we don't really see. I believe that our Christian heritage, as of the Middle Ages and up, mm -hmm. we have believe many lies and in that we have painted the things of God incorrectly um, to make them more like us. We've done that with our forefathers of America. We go back we're like yes. oh well Jefferson he had slaves he's having sex with slaves and, and we attribute all these negative things that aren't even actually based on reality but it's to make us feel better. Right. And I I think we've done that. You know, we again, like we talked about Jacob. Oh, he's the deceiver. He's done all these things. Yet, again, I'm not saying that there wasn't some deceit. But I'm saying that the way we paint him, we just belittle him so we feel better. And then right. it ends up where Esau ends up not looking so bad. Isn't that what we do today? We know that the Lord calls Jacob complete, perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we have to be so careful how we allow just... The world around us to form our decisions or, or our That's perspectives right. and then we go and we project that on the Word of God and we can't do that we right. need the Word of God to project on us that's how to yes, see the world that's how it should be it yes is. says these are the generations of Jacob Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flocks of his brothers and young men with him the sons of Belha and the sons of Zel uh, Zelpha his father's wives now that's interesting because before he doesn't he claim doesn't them, as wives, them as wives, and yeah. now it's his wife. Is because this is to show that those sons are equal heirs, mm. not to show some of that the wives, but the sons. Because this is all about the sons. There's nothing to do with the wives in this one. And it says that Joseph brought an evil report of them to his father. However, in some, I think it's the King James says that he brought an evil. He brought their evil report to his father. Well, that's a big difference. It is. So a basically what's happening is he came and told the truth about something that they were doing that wasn't good. I've heard many times, well, Joseph here, he's arrogant. He's a tattletale, negative, negative. Of course, the brothers wanted to get rid of him. You know, kind of like, well, he brought it on himself. But when he goes to Egypt, he becomes mature in the Lord. And then he learns. Right, right. Okay. Well, 
great, let's use that for ourselves, something that needs to be done. But when you really look at the word, for the word's sake, without man re-attaching re, um, meaning, I can't find that. I can find where he reported to his father what needed to be reported. Remember, Reuben lost his headship. He was no longer firstborn heir because of what he did with Belha. So it went to Joseph. Joseph rightfully has that. He didn't steal it. Now, the other boys may not like that, but he rightfully has that position. The reason why I suggest this is because Joseph is a type of Christ. So are we going to suggest that somehow Yeshua really deserved to be put on the cross? Was young and arrogant at yeah. 12? Right. Yeah, or young and arrogant, right. You're right. Are we going to suggest that? Because no. this is a type and shadow of Christ. And if we're going to put that on him, then it needs to be put on Yeshua because... The first part of Joseph li Joseph's life is where he is showing Joseph, the, the servant aspect of Yeshua. Because remember, later on in the story, when they meet him, he's the king. Mm -hmm. He's both. And you notice he's one person. Yes. Again. Again. They one see person. him one. And, they see, and who throws him in the pit? His brothers. His brothers. Who? Who, who rejected Yeshua? him. Right. His, His brothers. brothers. We also see the idea of the multicolored robe. Some will also say, no, it had to do with being a seamless robe. Mm -hmm. Again, we have Yeshua at the cross with a seamless robe. Mm -hmm. Well, Another cool comparison is they had that robe and they rolled dice for it. And what was left of Joseph, his robe that they put blood on, right? right. So yeah. you both have the robes that were being left. While the robes are left and they seem to be dead, right, they're both truly alive. Absolutely. Kind of cool. Yes, very cool. And they're both put in a pit. They're, I mean... Blah, blah, blah. I just really love what you said about it's the same person, the one that was thrown in the pit for three days and the one separated from his brothers and the one that was the king. Right. It's right here. I mean, yeah, that, that's just... in the Torah. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't, it was again, oh, there's that sowed. There's that, uh, not until Yeshua came and he says, right, or Paul mm -hmm. talks about how there are mysteries that we didn't understand right. until, right. okay, well, there's a mystery. They didn't get it was one person. They, they were looking for two. Mm -hmm. And then the Holy Spirit reveals, no, it's it was the same one. person. Oh, okay. When Joseph tells all his dreams to his brother, there's a point that where they say in 11, and his brothers envied him. Well, here's what's interesting. In Mark uh, 15, 9 through 20, and Matthew 27, it talks about how Pilate knew that they were going to give up Yeshua mm -hmm. because they envied him. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Both groups envied yes. Joseph and Yeshua. And what did they do? The result was, let's kill him. And that's what happens after we hear they envy him. He comes up, let's kill him. Now, the dreams that Joseph has, you have one where just the brothers bow. And then the next, you have the mother, father, you have everyone bowing. Well, mm -hmm. think about it. Doesn't that make sense? Next week, just the brothers come to him first mm -hmm. and bow. And then later, everyone comes. Yes. Same thing. The first time Yeshua came, just some have come and bowed. But mm -hmm. the second time, everyone will bow. So when the brothers see Joseph coming, they're like, let's get him. Like mob mentality, yes. I said a minute ago. So <clears throat> let's get him. And there's the debate, plan A, what are we going to do? Let's throw him in, let's kill him and just throw him down in a well, right? That's the plan A. And then Reuben's like, ah, you know. Now remember, Reuben was the oldest. Or he's, he's the, the one oldest. that lost it. He's huh? the one that lost it, yet he still, you know he's repentant. He's he's asked forgiveness because he still, as the oldest, feels responsible and wants to protect who has his job. If there was anyone there to be mad and want him gone, it, yeah, would, be it would be Reuben. Reuben. But Reuben's the one who says, throw him in the pit, I'll come get him later. And so Judah says in verse 27, come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hands be upon him, for he is our brother our flesh, and his brothers listen. So they're all like, yeah, good idea. Let's make something. However, we're told this week in 3915, Joseph says, for truly I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. In 3728, and the men, Midianite traders had passed by, and they pulled Joseph up and left him lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites. So the Midian men came and they pulled him out of the pit and they sold him. They got the cash. So all the brothers are left with is a robe. Uh. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when they take the robe, now understand this, they didn't take the robe physically to their dad and go, whose is this? Mm -hmm. None of them wanted to see. They knew their dad was going to be 
brokenness. But they chose their desires over the love of their father. Doesn't that sound familiar? It is. It's, you know what it is? Every generation is given the same test. Mm. It's how we respond to that test. So whether we say this is a generational curse that follows, or it's a generational testing. testing. Because yes. each generation can stop it. Judah stops it, and Joseph stops it. And the whole reason we're tested is to bring us to repentance. Right, I mean, to, to get rid of the dross <clears throat> yes. in our lives, to clean it out. In chapter 38, we have this odd switch. We're all about Joseph, and now suddenly we're going to talk about Judah. Real quick. Judah is the line of the king. What do mm -hmm. kings have? Kings have staffs, they have robes, and they have rings. Mm -hmm. Well, he seems to have that because he gives it to Tamar. But okay. let's understand it from a scriptural view. He married a Canaanite. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. No, no. So we have Tamar going to have the child through the pure line of Judah. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes that's what allows the line to continue. And she's mentioned because she is in the direct line of Yeshua. Yes. So it can't be a Canaanite. Right. There's yeah. speculation that Tamar was actually the daughter of a priest. Not a Canaanite, but of somewhere else. Which makes me go, wouldn't it be interesting if she was like of another one of Abraham's other children? Ooh, who would have known yes. the proper? Because we have in 38.24 where Judah learns that Tamar's pregnant. His thing is, let her be burned. Oh my goodness. However, this is interesting because this is, this is Torah. When the daughter of a priest whores, her sentence is death by fire. She's burned. Which if you take it on the bigger mystical aspect, Babylon the whore is burned. of all whores is burned in the lake of fire. Mm-hmm. Kind of interesting, huh? On those bigger patterns. That's why all those levels are so awesome. Yes. Her response, obviously, when she hears she's going to be burned, because they go back and they say, Burn her. She's like, Hold on. I would like you to take these things and see mm -hmm. whose these are. Just like Judah didn't have the unk to go back and go, Daddy, whose are these? He had right. them sent. She did the same thing. But she did it not in the idea of belittling, but in the, are you going to be honest this time? Mm -hmm. And when he got him, he could have said, well, I don't know who these are. Yeah. But he didn't. At that point, it's that turning point where he says, oh, she was She's more righteous, more righteous than, than, I, than am. I am. Yeah. So 39, we jump back into the story of Joseph where we left him. He was sold. He went into Potiphar's house. Potiphar. So the wife is very enamored and would like to have Joseph for her own. Right? Yes. The Hebrew boy. And she makes, a, you know, the accusation of, look what this Hebrew did. He came in to mock me. And she's holding that robe. Man, those robes are getting they, people yeah, in trouble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> people in trouble. So she holds that coat. And the husband gets so mad. I propose the husband is really mad at the wife. Yeah. <laughs> I just lost the best housekeeping guy, the best servant I've ever had because of you. Because I got to save face. Because he's the head executioner. Just kill the dude. Right. But he did. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go send you to the prison and make sure you're ahead of the prison. Mm -hmm. The wonderful thing about Joseph is even when all this is happening, his thing with the wife was like, I can't do this to the Lord. Right. Again, it shows back to Jacob, that heart of wanting. Jacob wanted the promise. Mm -hmm. Joseph wants to remain faithful to God. He wants that. And, I mean, he didn't even let the temptation. Yet you see Judah over here who had the temptation. He's like, Whoa, I want that. And isn't that... It says a lot about Joseph that he can remain in that frame of mind after he'd been sold, after he'd separated from Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, he still remained faithful. I yeah. mean, that's amazing. And let me add this about the dreams. Had Joseph never told those dreams, then the brothers could have never seen the fulfillment of the yes. Lord's promises. Yes. So while they said, well, he should have never told them. You know, how many times are we led by the Lord to tell somebody something and they don't like what they hear? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. did not Yeshua say things that made people mad all the time? Yes, he So did. should he have not said them? No, because he was in a position where the Lord's like, you need to say them. And Chapter 40 brings us to the end of this week's Torah portion, and it's where Joseph is interpreting the dreams. There are two dreams. One is about the wine, mm -hmm. and one is about the bread. I love it because the blood... 
Life is in the blood. Mm -hmm. And then the flesh is death. And he had both those roles. Yes. And here we have this. And we have Joseph, who is a type of Christ, who's explaining this is life and this is death. Mm -hmm. A guy who's in a pit that everyone thinks, his whole family thinks he's dead. Yes. And he's the one showing this is what will come. One that lives and one that dies. One that takes on the blame. Mm -hmm. One that has life. I mean, it's... Talk Everywhere. about all the different Everywhere. layers. It really is. It really is. <clears throat> the last point is, you see Abraham and Isaac. And Abraham sees the events of Isaac like the father sees the events of Yeshua. Jacob and Joseph. Jacob sees the events that happen with Joseph as Israel sees what happens. Where he dies, he's gone. They don't know where he is. And then he's with the king. It's so important because we need to realize the Lord showed us both perspectives. He's mm -hmm. giving us that inside knowledge, like in Job. We know what happened. We right. understand that, yeah, he was gone, but he's not really gone. Yes. He's alive right now. We get to know he's going to come back as king. All that, we should be able to have hope. We realize that, that with Israel, not condemnation that it happened, but hope. They have hope. Mm -hmm. We have hope in understanding that even though we behaved this way, we reacted this way, He's healed us. He's allowed us to go through those hard knocks so we could come out and see him for who he is. Yes. Because remember, when they didn't accept him, Gentiles accepted him. Right. And then we get all grafted in. And mm -hmm. that's what's happened. That's where we are today. Israel's Amen. becoming one. The two sticks, Ephraim and Manasseh, are back through Yeshua. Yes. So that's it for this week. Thank you guys very much for joining us, and we hope you have a great week. Shalom. Shalom.